Income Tax 2023-2024. American Opportunity Credit. Can you claim the credit? Get ready and some coffee, because if taxes were an animal, the government would definitely be a leech. Ew, get it off. We're trying, we're trying, just stay calm. If your heartbeat goes up too much, then it pumps the blood more and the leech sucks more of it that way. Just stay calm. Most of this information. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey saying. So get one because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. It can be found in publication 970 tax benefits for education tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're at the bottom part of the income tax formula where the credits live, remembering the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement ending at taxable income instead of net income. Therefore, taxable income basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula, but it's only half the battle, half the story. We still have the second half of the income tax formula, taking the taxable income, calculating the tax based on it, not using a flat tax, mind you, but rather a progressive tax system we've talked about in prior courses and or sections, giving us the tax before credits and other taxes. Next, we have the credits and other taxes, other taxes, including things like self-employment tax if you're dealing with a schedule c sole proprietor for example credits being similar to deductions in that both credits and deductions are good but if you got a dollar deduction up here in the income statement part that dollar would simply decrease the taxable income giving a benefit based on the tax rate the tax brackets that people are in whereas if we got a dollar credit we might get that full dollar benefit of the credit if the credit is up top here in the non-refundable area and we had enough tax liability to consume the credit. That would then give us to the total tax. Next, we have the tax payments and refundable credits. Now, the payments that we make, of course, are withholdings and estimated tax payments we make during the year. We have refundable credits in this section because they can take the tax liability below zero. So even if we don't have enough liability to consume the credit, we might get a benefit from it, making the tax code not into a tax collection tool, but whether a welfare or benefit tool in that case, leading us to the tax refund or tax due. This is the uh, form 1098T tuition statement because we're thinking about the education credits, remembering that what is happening with the education credits is that we're deviating to some degree of the general principle of an income tax, meaning when should you get a tax benefit for income taxes typically? When you are consuming things to directly generate the revenue. That's the idea which you can most clearly see on a Schedule C where the expenses, deductions related to business are on the Schedule C because they are there to help consume or create 
the revenue. Now, in various areas of the tax code, the tax code deviates from that because of politics and because of they're trying to nudge people to do certain things and so on and so forth. We see this with retirement plans, for example, where the argument is we're going to give tax benefits for people to put money into an IRA or 401k plan and so on and so forth. And we see this with various items on the deductibility of the itemized deductions with charitable deductions and so on and so forth. And of course, with the education. Remembering the argument for education would be there's a societal, economic, beneficial externality of people getting an education and therefore it makes sense for us to subsidize the education. You can argue against that. I think there's valid arguments about that that are quite interesting to make because I think the quality of education has gone down and the institutions have been somewhat corrupted by subsidization and shielded against market pressures which would actually strengthen it but that's going to be that's going to be the basic idea so then the government wants to incentivize how can they do that they can make a deduction for it or a credit for it and the two big credits are the american opportunity credit and the lifetime learning credit at this point in time if you can get the credits then we're probably going to take those first and then move to to if we can take a deduction after because that's probably the order in which we get the most benefit from the items and if we go to a qualified institution in a similar fashion as with a bank having to issue a 1098 for example related to mortgages interest on a home loan the financial institution in exchange for dealing with partially government interest things here they by the way they call like an a, a many public institutions like many schools not for profit organizations but they can kind of almost be thought of a, a, a like a almost a for profit organization that is in aligned with the government right the government is intertwined in some way at least providing loans oftentimes to the students who are taking the courses and that means that the government has has the leverage to force the schools to do what they want to do which in part of course is going to be issuing the 1098t so they can double check the tax returns uh, that are being prepared and so on right so this is form 8863 the education credits so and, and this is the form 1040 page number two where we would be reporting those credits this is uh, the tax and credits portion and the payments portion non-refundable credits up here refundable credits down there all right so can you claim the credit so remember there's two credits we're specifically looking at the american opportunity credit at this time the one that's more uh restrictive the one that you would like to qualify for first and if not then move on to the next one the following rules will help you determine if you are eligible to claim the american opportunity credit on your tax return who can claim the credit generally you can claim the american opportunity credit if all three of the following requirements are met you pay qualified education expenses of higher education so you pay the education expenses for an eligible student and the eligible student is either yourself your spouse or a dependent you claim on your tax return so once again what are the qualifications you pay qualified uh, education expenses so we have to then define what does that mean what are qualified education expenses now obviously tuition for a college most like a standard four-year college would qualify but you could have questions in terms of what institutions would qualify and what things other than tuition might qualify we also could have cutoff questions in terms of when we pay for the tuition versus when we actually are going to the classes right and then you pay the education expenses for an eligible student who is an eligible student uh so so that's going to be a, something that we're going to have to of course define and then the eligible student is either yourself your spouse or a dependent you claim on your tax return in other words who do i get to claim the credit for usually someone that's on the tax return name social security is on the tax return why because it's either yourself your spouse or your dependent that's going to be the general idea so note 
qualified education expenses paid by a dependent you claim on your tax return or by a third party for that dependent are considered paid by you. So we get into this whole situation of who paid for the actual education? Whose bank account did it come out of? Well, it doesn't really matter so much because it matters more about who is who the person is getting a tax benefit, meaning who is claiming the person on the tax return. Is it you? Is it uh, you and your spouse of married filing joint? Is the kid that's going to college possibly filing their own return or are you claiming them as a dependent? Those, and, and if they are on the tax return, then you would think that is the person that's gonna get the benefit from it, even if, for example, an uncle paid for the, the, the schooling out of his checking account, right? Because again, the uncle can't get the benefit of the taxes, of the, of, of the tax credit, somebody should get the benefit. And so you would think that would be the person that's claiming the person who was actually had the qualified education. All right, student qualifications. Generally, you can claim the American Opportunity Credit for a student only if all the following four requirements are met. So as of the beginning of 2023, the student had not completed the first four years of post-secondary education, generally the freshman through senior years of college as determined by the eligible educational institution. Now, this is something that seems fairly straightforward, but it becomes more and more complex as schools kind of differ in their structure. So it used to be that all the schools were kind of following this four year game plan and you would be going through freshman through senior year pretty straightforward. But clearly that's not the only model that you can think of doing, especially if you're talking about like trade schools or something like that. Uh, so where the goal isn't to like have a well-rounded education in everything, but rather to try to try to gear someone towards practical job skills and so on and so forth. So therefore you can imagine different schools still have to kind of comply with the structure of the four year structure, uh, but, the, but it might look a little bit different based on the institution and also obviously students are going to be going through those four years at different rates meaning you have certain requirements typically to complete what they would consider your freshman year and so on versus sophomore year and so on and so forth in terms of credits not in terms of just time that you were there and that might take you 10 years to do hopefully it doesn't but it possibly could i mean you could still be there seven years and you're still like a, a sophomore or something in terms of credit hours for the school so the point is that the school kind of is the one that's determining whether or not you have gone from, from a freshman to a sophomore or whatnot, and it's based more on the credits, you would think, rather than the actual number of years that you've been going to, say, college, for example. So for the purpose, don't include academic credit awards solely because of the student's performance on uh, proficiency exams. Now, this, again, complicates the situation because you can imagine a really smart person going in there. I can't imagine myself doing that, but you can imagine a really smart person going in there and saying they, he just passes a test or something, or she just passes a test and they give him and they, and they give him a, a bunch of credits and he starts as a, as a, as a, as a junior or senior or something. Okay. Well then what do you do? So do you just lose the credit? You would think that would be unfair to the person who actually is just smart. We want the smart per people to go to school so that they can because the whole ben, the remember the point of this is the positive externalities of giving people especially smart people you know education so that they they go do stuff and make stuff for the rest of us and that benefits everyone right so so it wouldn't be doesn't seem quite right to say well if you get we're going to take away the benefit if you happen to be so smart that you <laughs> that you didn't need to do the first two years and they just gave you those credits based on an examination. So that would be like a kind of exception. So the American Opportunity Credit has not been claimed by you or anyone else, see below, for this student for any four tax years before 2023. Now remember, these two things look similar, but and they are similar, but they're not the same. Because again, the first one is determined by the educational institution based on kind of how many credits you've you have and so on and so forth and the second one just means in terms of time 
So if I, if I deducted for four years already, then I still might only be a sophomore in terms of this first requirement because I haven't completed that many credits, but it's already been passed four years. So notice the second one, what is it doing from a legislative or incentive standpoint? It's basically trying to, it looks like it's trying to say, hey, look, you would be better off maybe doing the four years with, within four years. And then we'll give you the tax benefit if you do it in the proper time frame. But if you go over the four years to do four years worth of schooling or so on, then you, you lose the benefit of the American Opportunity Credit, but you might still get benefits basically from the lifetime learning credit seems to be possibly the idea when they were putting it in place. So if the American Opportunity Credit has been claimed for this student for any three or fewer tax years before 2023, this requirement is met. So for at least one academic period beginning or treated as beginning in 2023, the student both was enrolled in a program that leads to a degree certification or other recognized educational credential. So now we have the, the, the idea that it, what's the program that they have to be in. And remember, as students become more diversified and as the large institutions, in my opinion, are failing, right? That means that more people are going to look for other options to get the needs that they that they need for education turn to youtube or something probably be, but but so but that's so that means that you're going to get possibly more educational structures that 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 are not traditionally structured possibly possibly geared towards a vocational thing or or something like that and then of course you've got to make sure that the that the that it qualifies for this somewhat more restrictive requirement than uh, than the lifetime learning credit. And usually, of course, the institution that you're thinking to go at, and remember, no matter what institution you go to, whether, whether it be, I don't trust really any of them these days, whether it be a really large institution because they are completely beholden to the government because of financing, but so are the, the not-for-profit smaller organizations that are trade school organizations because they still typically have uh, student loan interests that really may, make it make it so they have they have a lot of like restrictions in terms of how they might operate and so on. So obviously you have to think about exactly what institution is best for you and put some time into thinking about that. But the institution should of course be able to answer questions about whether they qualify for a for a lifetime learning credit and uh, American Opportunity Credit and so forth. So carried at least one half of the normal full-time workload for their course of study. So the, the, the standard for what is half of the normal full-time workload is determined by each educational institution. So now we have this requirement of how much time or how many classes you've took into play. Now remember, there's, there's also this cutoff up top that we've talked about because, because when you pay for education, you pay for it before you get the education. The school wants the money up front. That means that you could have paid for it in 2023, but you didn't start the courses until 2024. So we want to try to say the cash-based method as much as possible, unless someone is trying to abuse it, which is why the government says, well, if you have three, if you started the courses within three months of 2024, then, and you paid it in 2023, then that kind of counts for the payment being made in 2023. And then we have to determine if you're half, uh, you know, how much schooling that you had. Now, in terms of are you half time or full time and so on and so forth, which is determined by the institution. And again, this becomes more complex than it used to be because it used to be all colleges were kind of structured under the same mold and so forth. But as things change, then it might not fit for some schools to to be in in semester or quarter hours or something like that they might it might be better for them to do something different and then if that happens then the institution still has to somehow figure out what it means to be half time and full time and all this other stuff because they have to be compliant with the rules so that students can can do the taxes right so you see how the even if even if you had a private school, you see how the government has kind of through their tax code on individuals kind of manipulated how the 
businesses would work and whatnot. This is bureaucracy, right? So because it might not be the most efficient way for a school to run, uh, to have to to have to comply with the structure that the government wants, just so they can apply their this you know credit rules and whatnot. So that's what kind of builds up, and it's kind of weird. Anyways, however, the standard may not be lower than any of those established by the U.S. Department of Education under the Higher Education Act of 1965. So for 2023, treat an academic period beginning in the first three months of 2024 as if it began in 2023. If qualified education expenses for the student are paid in 2023 for that economic period, academic period, see prepaid expenses later. So again, we, we, they want to be on a cash-based method, but they're skeptical, of course, that you're going to take advantage of the cash-based system by manipulating when you pay the money. Usually the IRS will say, I want you on a cash-based system for many things, but if you prepay things, then we're going to make an exception to the rule because we think you're cheating kind of the system. In this case, we've got that three-month kind of thing to, to deal with the fact that we prepay for our education. So as of the end of 2023, the student had not been convicted of a federal or state felony for possessing or distributing controlled substance. Man, that's why most people go to school, isn't it? They go there to sell. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But but obviously they threw that in there because that is a substantial problem on the college campuses, drugs and whatnot, even though it doesn't seem to kind of fit in to the education credit and so on. But Example number one. So Sharon was eligible for the American Opportunity Credit for 2017, 2018, 2020, and 2022. Sharon's parents claimed the American Opportunity Credit for Sharon on their 2017, 18, and 2020 tax returns. Sharon claimed the American Opportunity Credit for her 2022 tax return. So now the American Opportunity Credit has been claimed for Sharon for four tax years. So there's the four tax years rule. So remember, we have the four years. Has she completed four years of, of higher education according to the credit hours of the school? That's not the requirement. That's not what we're looking at here. We're looking at the other rule saying, did someone basically claim the American Opportunity Credit for four years? It, now they did. Now you might say, but yeah, it was her parents. Her parents, because she was a dependent on her parents' return, claimed her for the American Opportunity Credit for, for three years, but she only claimed the American Opportunity Credit for one year. So you would think, well, then she should be able to claim it again because she only she gets four years to be able to claim it. But no, you get four years for one student, four years per social security number. You might be saying, well, she should be graduating if she's already done four years. But no, as we've seen, examples like me weren't done after four after four years still rolling uh you know so you could still so so uh you're not so that's a different rule all right so therefore the american opportunity credit can't be claimed by sharon for 2023 so if sharon were to file form 8863 for 2023 the box on part three line 23 should be checked yes and only the lifetime learning credit would be able to be claimed so we'll talk about the lifetime learning credit later but this would be an example where we're going to try and say can we get the american opportunity credit answer no because you've been you've claimed it more than four years or someone has for your education and therefore you're going to default to the lifetime learning credit most likely being able to take that one example another two let's take a look at another wilbert wilbert willie was eligible for the american opportunity credit for 2019 2020 2021 2023 wilbert's Parents claimed the American Opportunity Credit for Wilbert on their tax returns for 2019, 2020, 2021. No one claimed the American Opportunity Credit for Wilbert for any other tax year. The American Opportunity Credit has been claimed for Wilbert for only three tax years before 2023. Therefore, Wilbert meets the second requirement to be eligible for the American Opportunity Credit. So in this case, you're going to say Wilbert was eligible for the American Opportunity Credit for for 19, 20, 21. We're looking at tax year 2023. What's the thing they're trying to point out here? They're trying to point out, hey, look, no one. He skipped school in 2022. What did he do? He went he 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 got too crazy at college and he went on a bender or something, traveled to Europe and 
became a, a hippie or something. And then he was like, wow, I got to stop this, man. And then he came back to school <laughs> and finished the next year. I don't know. I'm just making that. That might not be a Wilbert story. I'm just kidding. I'm just, but the point is that it doesn't have to be in consecutive years, right? Because they claimed it in 1920, 21, but they didn't claim it. He didn't, they, no one claimed it in 22. Therefore, he hasn't met the four-year requirement because it doesn't have to be in order. That's the point, okay? It's not Wilbert's stupid hippie bender. That's not the point of the story. In any case, uh, if Wilbert were to file eight, uh, form 8863 for 2023, uh, the tax box on part three, line 23 should be checked. No, if Wilbert meets all the other requirements, he is eligible for the American Opportunity Credit. Let's do another example. Number three, Glenda enrolls as a full-time basis in a degree program for 2024 spring semester, which begins January uh, 2024. Glenda pays the tuition for the 2024 spring semester in December. So we have a cutoff example, right? Because the college wants their money beforehand, especially these big universities. They take your money beforehand and then they come up with some kind of excuse as to why they're going to kick you off the campus and, and you have to do an online course or something. And, the, and then you, they already have your money. You know, that's how they do things apparently these days. So because the tuition Glinda paid and 2023 relates to an economic period that begins in the first three months of 2024, the eligibility to claim an American Opportunity Credit in 2023 is determined as if the 2024 spring semester began in 2023. So in other words, we're usually on a cash-based method, but the IRS knows that just in the normal process, you're usually, you're often going to pay the first part of 2000 of the next year in the current year. So in this case, you're going to pay for first part of 2024 in 2023. So they're going to say that's still cool that you can record it in 2023. So you don't have to do any funny bookkeeping situation to try to determine the cutoffs, which are different between when you paid the money and when you actually went to school, because that gets confusing, even though it's actually more accurate and people don't like doing that accrual kind of thing. So therefore, Glinda satisfies the third requirement. That's good. Tip, uh, if the requirement above aren't met for any student, you can't claim the American Opportunity Credit for that student. You may be able to claim the Lifetime Learning Credit for part or all of that student's qualified education expenses. Instead, though, we'll talk about the Lifetime Learning Credit later. It's more broad, less requirements, learning for life indicated by the title unlike current bills these days like the like the inflation reduction act i kind of like that tradition you know when they name stuff like they actually tried to make the name like kind of say what the bill did i it's kind of quaint i guess but i still kind of like it any case i think they should go back to that who can't claim the credit you might ask you can't claim the american opportunity credit for 2023 if any of the following apply your filing status is married filing separate. So we've seen this multiple times. The IRS, if you're married, then you can you, you generally will file married filing joint, but have the opportunity to file married filing separate. But the IRS is skeptical of letting people do that with regards to certain credits that have especially income limitations and whatnot, because it's going to get quite confusing. If they were to do that, people then filing separate just to to meet income limitations to take advantage of credit limits and so on so you are claimed as a dependent on another person's tax return such as your parents return so if you're a student going to school remember that the dependent requirements are a little bit different right because the age could go up to 24 uh, and and if you're a full-time student possibly still being a dependent on your parents return and in that case it might, and, and that might make sense, of course, because the idea is if someone is a full-time student, they, they don't have enough time to earn enough money for themselves. They're not uh, dependent and therefore they're not going to owe that much taxes and therefore the tax benefit of a credit, although there could possibly be a refundable portion to it, but it's not the full amount of the credit is probably going to not going to be as beneficial from a tax purpose standpoint on the student's return as it would be on the parent's return if the parent claims the student as a dependent and claims the American Opportunity Credit. So that kid, even though they're getting old and you don't, you don't, they're not, they're not as valuable to you, you know, you don't get that child tax credit 
or possibly the earned income credit anymore. They're becoming diminishing returns as they get older, but at least you might still get the education credit if you spend a bunch of money sending them to college at least, which I don't, I'm not sure that's going to come out as a net plus. But in any case, I uh, see who can claim independent expenses later. So your qualified, your, your modified adjusted gross income, the MAGI is here's the income phase out, right? 90,000 or more, uh, 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 is 90,000, 180,000 or more if married filing jointly. So if you go over that threshold, then, then you've, your income phase out, uh, kicks in, right? So the, the modified adjusted gross income is explained later under the effect of the amount of your income on the amount of your credit. So usually when you have this kind of thing, there's a phase out kind of situation. And then of course, at some point, the entire credit goes away entirely. All right. So you or your spouse were a non-resident alien for any part of 2023 and the non-resident alien uh, didn't elect to be treated as a resident alien for tax purposes. More information on non-resident aliens can be found in publication 519 U.S. Tax Guide for Aliens. So you're, you weren't issued an SSN, Social Security Number, or I-10 by the due date of your 2023 return, including extensions. You can't claim the American Opportunity Credit on either your original or amended tax, uh, amended 2023 return. Also, you can't claim this credit on your original or amended 2023 return for a student who wasn't issued an SSN social security number or an A-10, if not the SSN adoption uh, number or the I-10. So by the due date of your tax return, including extensions, if an A-10 or I-10 is applied or uh, on or before the due date of a 2023 return, including extensions, the IRS issues an I-10 or an A-10 or I-10. As a result of the application, the IRS will consider the A-10 or I-10 as issued on or before the due date of the return. I don't think that was worded very well. Is it just me? I, f I feel like, but uh, maybe I'm just getting tired. Any case, that's the idea.